Hello, how are you doing? Hope you're doing well. Hope your family's well. Thank you for joining us and being a part of this. Maybe you feel tired by watching a video, you're videoed out. I know it can be taxing for me, trying, anybody trying to film videos and record them. But uh, very thankful that we have this technology to do this and being able to post it. We can still have a connection like on Wednesday night. And Bart had his little devotional thought on Monday and Sunday as well providing that. So hopefully it's something if you're a part of our local congregation, if you are not and you're a part of the body of Christ, we appreciate you so much in being a part of this and hopefully it can bring you encouragement. We finished our lesson thought and series on Esther, even when God is not seen. We're switching gears to the New Testament and what I call lessons from the chief sinner. Again, lessons from the chief sinner. How would you like to have the skeletons of old in your memory bank closet? To be, to be revealed for everyone to see, to know, and to study. When someone's running from a political office, whether it be local, state, or federal, especially if it's higher up, it seems like whether it's a chief justice, whether it's judicial, whether it's legislative or even executive branch, that we hear everything, that something is found, it could be 20 years ago, 30, 40, whatever. But how would you like if all of your negative things, even if it's been forgiven, to be brought up for us to know about it and learn and study more about you? Can you imagine your deepest, darkest, darkest sin to be exposed for the world, the entire world to know, and every translation that's available that's translated for other people to know it in their language? That's the case for Paul. The Apostle Paul's life is on display for us to read and study and apply. His dark and most devastating early life prior to his transformation in Christ on his way to Damascus and with Ananias helping him with his steps to salvation. You know, Paul's early life, when obviously Saul was a religious terrorist, there's no, there's no question about it. He was a terrorist. He would be a religious zealot terrorist. He'd be no different than the radicalization of people in their religion who are fanatics about their religion, and, and it's theirs or no one else's, and by all means necessary, by force. He is that individual. However, the part of Paul's life is open to us, that early life, and it's known to us, and it's been studied, it's been learned about, it's been memorized, it's been preached on and taught on. And this thought for this series, Lessons from the Chief Sinner, comes from what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying, Paul says, worthy of all acceptance. That Christ came into the world to save sinners, whom I am chief. I truly believe that the Apostle Paul, by what he said specifically, explicitly said, but what we could apply faithfully without taking out of context, that if it was a line of sinners, he would be at the very beginning the head of the most gravest, darkest sinner. He's the chief. I know sin is sin, that, and God teaches, you know, obviously sin is separation from God, and all of sin falls short of the God. There's none righteous, no, not one. I'm aware of those things, but, but various sins had different consequences and carried different weight. I think we can agree with that. A religious terrorist who persecuted men and women of the faith, well, I don't think that's comparable to someone's lying, cheating, who's maybe been unfaithful, as, 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 as hard as those are. But imagine being a religious terrorist. That's, that's just another level, isn't it? Yet, 
if Paul was able, even as a religious terrorist, if he was able to be transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ and to embrace God's forgiveness as he was chief, as he believed the sinners, then guess what? So can you, so can me. Paul's life are lessons to us. Lessons from the chief of sinners. Today I want us to look at Saul as he was spared eventually, but seeing what he endured and what he did from the pits of the sin, eventually he would be spared by the grace and love of God. And I think as we see Saul, who is Paul, prior to his conversion, we see that that people can change. People can today can change. People that we think they cannot change can change because of the power of God. If you have your Bible, we're going to have our text tonight in Acts chapter 7. We want to look at verses 54 through 60. Again, Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60. Reading from the New King James Version. When they heard these things, they were cut into the heart after Stephen, what he had to say in his sermon gnashed at him with their teeth, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing. The only time that's said, and maybe you've heard that before, where Jesus is standing at the right hand of God, not sitting at the right hand of God. And said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing, not sitting, at the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, they stopped their ears. They ran at him with one accord. It's a mob, angry mob, wrathful mob, mob out of control. It's dangerous. They cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Yes, this is Paul, the apostle, when he's younger. They stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord, Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. The example that our Lord, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen follows that example and says that as his last words. He fell asleep after breathing his death. I love how that's worded, his death. He died a horrible, tragic, awful death. Oh, the Bible says he fell asleep. He died, but it's much more pleasant than horrific, awful death. What we see here is a brutal scene that's taking place here. The first appearance of Paul is when he's a young man named Saul. And he's there, a guilt by association, as Stephen, who's the, known as the first Christian martyr, is being literally taken out of the city so he capital punishment can be... Uh, done for him, and he is stoned to death. They cast him out so they can stone him, and imagine this young young man Saul stood there in agreement to the violent death of this horrible, horrible situation. I don't think she would mind me saying this, but one of our members, Miss Nancy Krause, was a nurse a medical nurse in Africa. I don't know the country. She told me, and I've forgotten. I don't want to say the country's name, but she said to me, and I know she shared this with some, that for some reason, someone through tribal um, guilt, the judge, jury, but the sentence was to be stoned. And she saw that. And what she said of just witnessing someone being stoned to death was... It's hard to hear that, but I can't imagine her seeing that. That's something that's still vivid in her mind. I don't know if Paul ever forgot what he saw that day. I don't know how you could ever forget it and erase someone being literally stoned to death. Horrible, horrible, brutal scene that we see here. Well, who is Stephen? In Acts chapter 6, we get a little bit about his character. He's described in Acts chapter 6 as he's full of grace and power. He spoke with the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 15, which I've always found an interesting phrase, what does that actually look like? But his countenance shone like the face of an angel. 
That's an interesting description, isn't it? To explore that more, I would love to. To have the face of an angel. Stephen was an extraordinary Christian man. They stoned not a horrible convict who everybody didn't like and that was the bane of society. He wasn't a Osama bin Laden. He wasn't a notorious murderer and betrayer. He was a Christian full of grace of the Holy Spirit whose face shone like an angel. That's the person they stoned, murdered, homicide, took his life in a brutal, painful way. And yet think about Stephen for a moment. Here's a man who dedicated his life to, to Christ, to being a follower of Christ, but that didn't mean that he would have a nice, sweet passing away and while he's asleep at night, going to bed and waking up, seeing the Lord. His death was by stoning. And, and, and sometimes we struggle when people, God's people, have painful deaths and we wonder, God, why, why are are they facing that? And yet, here's Stephen, who is a tremendous Christian servant of God, who is boldly speaking and telling the word as is, even knowing his audience, and they may not be receptive of it, but they needed to hear the truth. He had the courage to do that. And they were so angry and they were so wrathful towards him. They cast him out of the city and they immediately stoned him, throwing their outer garments at Saul's feet. I wonder what did this do to this young man, Saul, as he witnessed this and as he saw Stephen after he breathed his last dead. He imagined the marks on his physical body from the stones being thrown and cast at him. Broken bones, maybe, from the weight of the stone impacting him. I don't know. I like to just thinking about that and just how that was. For the brutality that he saw as a young man, would it desensitize him towards other Christian men and women who stood opposed to what he thought was the law that should be the law of Moses? You see... Young Saul, who would eventually become Paul, was not always the great-minded missionary and church planter, wasn't raised in Christianity, wasn't, you know, just a, a product of just a local church being the best of the best of the studious. He was of the law of Moses, of the Gamaliel, and, and part of those showing their animosity towards Christianity. He was there. They laid it out at his feet. He was a young man being ripe in a pedigree, if you will, of being the best of the best of the religious zealots of the old law of Moses and, and uh, of showing force where force needed to be shown. This is the first appearance of Paul in his early life in Scripture. This is the first time we hear about this young man named Saul. A brutal scene for this young man to be a part of. Again, one of the many events that would later in his life to say that Christ came to save the sinners whom I am the chief. I'm the chief of sinners. I think beyond this brutal scene, we have a building, number two, a building situation. In Acts 22, verse 3, when Paul is the missionary and church planner, Paul says about his early life that I was a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a well-known, respected uh, teacher of the law. Saul lived his younger days understanding the teaching that stood against the teaching and preaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the beginning of Acts, thousands were being led by the power of the gospel and the teaching of the apostles. Many, even of Judaism, were being converted over into Christianity. And as this was happening, the jealousy among the the religious sect leaders of Judaism was jealousy, animosity 
wrathfulness towards the Christian church. If you look in Acts chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, they were filled with indignation. They laid their hands on the apostles, some of their earlier mo movements. They had enough of hearing this. They, they, they showed force. They laid their hands. And I don't imagine they just simply took their hand. They literally forced, grabbed them, threw them in prison. God would rescue them miraculously. Their plan of stopping this new movement at crucifying what they thought was the leader of Christ had failed. If we take away Christ, surely it would dissipate, but they didn't. They failed to realize that it's so much bigger than that. It's what was needed, what was planned, and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ has the power to save all people. And as we know, what Jesus said earlier, that the gates of death itself, the death of even Jesus will not prevail against it. These force... As we see today, when people stand opposed, they use force, they use scare tactics. If we throw some people in prison, surely, and locking it up, surely that will stop people from being be, becoming Christians, following Christ, speaking it, teaching it. They tried locking up, but that didn't work. Their hatred was just festering and building up, and it was a perfect storm when Stephen was there to say what he had to say to those that were there. They had endured enough of that and they had put some in prison they were not able to stay they got out miraculously still wanting to stop it and Stephen was there and it was just the perfect storm for them to unleash what they did they took another life because of their hatred Jesus had been crucified they took Stephen's life they stoned him again they were trying to set a precedence that we don't want Christianity it shouldn't spread. Why would someone brutally take someone's life? They want to sin religiously for religious reasons to send a message of fear. Fear is a weapon that continues to be used today. If fear can paralyze us and prevent us to not share what we need to share, then fear has done its job and the enemy has done its job. I've been several times fortunate to the 9-11 memorial there in Manhattan. It's a moving experience like any memorial. I've been to the Pearl Harbor as well. It's really well done and could spend all day in there. But in the memorial itself, there is a section talking about Osama bin Laden, about Al-Qaeda and their ideology. And you can sit and you can see video upon video and some of it is training video of, of Al-Qaeda soldiers and they're, they're wrapped up, their faces are covered, they're holding uh, automatic weapons and they are doing training and exercises preparing and it's kind of leading you up in a time capsule, if you will, kind of leading up to these men that were able to infiltrate, get on these planes and do what they were able to do. When you're in that section, it's an eerie part when you, when you hear these videos and you see people talking about Osama bin Laden, some of the earlier uh, news about him and about kind of some of the things that they've done. There was a bombing with the ship, um, kind of some earlier precursors leading up before the 9-11-2001 that took place. You know, Paul mentioned his earlier life later on in Timothy. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he says, I was formerly a blasphemer. I was a persecutor, an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was a terrorist. He was the accomplice there among with those as Stephen was being murdered. No, no, he didn't throw a stone, but he was there in agreement. He was a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent man, throwing men and women in prison, Christian men and women in prison. You see, as we see Paul, yes, he's the great missionary. He's responsible for a lot of the New Testament letters, church planning, missionary work, and we'll get to that part, but you got to understand the story. 
you got to understand why Paul embraced the grace of God and why Paul and his mercy and what God did to him was tremendous. And yet he still remembered his former life because he mentioned it. And he said, I'm the chief of sinners. He still struggled with that, even though understanding that Christ did save. And he did feel forgiven and he expressed that. And yet it's a great comfort as we see lesson from a chief of sinner. I think that when you read about a great life, biography or not a biography, you, you find surprises. Things that you didn't think about would happen, happened. Who would have thought prior to one of the greatest missionaries in the Christian age ever, one of the greatest church planners ever, came from a background of spiritual blindness and physical brutality, training. I think the lesson is there. Wherever you came from, whatever you have done, whoever you once were, I believe this. No one is beyond hope. Even though your past is marred with sin, we can begin anew in our present as we look towards our future. If the chief of sinners, who he believed was the chief of sinners, can be saved by Christ and the grace of God, then let me tell you something, my friends. So can us. We do not have to allow our past to anchor us down. Christ did too much for us, for us to be anchored by our troubled past. Let us embrace him, embrace the present that we're in as we look forward to our glorious future. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you for Paul's life and it's open to us as an open book and we can learn so much from it and seeing where he came from and how he was literally transformed and calling upon us to be transformed too. The lesson is so strong. If he can be be changed by the gospel and and feel forgiven, so can we. And I pray we can see the power of Jesus and understanding that even if we've been forgiven by Jesus Christ, that we need to feel that forgiveness. We need to forgive ourselves, embrace our present of who we are as children of God and look forward to someday dwelling with you. And we're grateful for the grace and mercy that's extended to us by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are so thankful. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.